Good morning and welcome to this week's programme, an addition to mark the height of the GAA season and focused especially on Hurling and Cork, prompted by their win in last Sunday's All-Ireland. From the archives, Cork Hurling in the 1940s and its two most famous names, Christy Ring and Jack Lynch. Memories of the Thunder and Lightning final of 1939, 60 years ago, played just as World War II broke out and how radio, or wireless, transformed public enthusiasm for Gaelic games in the 30s and 40s. This morning's programme is prompted by events in Croke Park last Sunday. Fortunately, and this is to the credit of the sports department down the years, the archive holdings on sport well reflect its importance in Irish life and in Irish memories. Sports enthusiasts like hearing about the old days, and as there isn't a stopwatch involved, they can claim in a manner which can't be claimed in athletics, for instance, that the standards were higher in the old days. Nowadays, of course, standards of fitness and speed would be higher. But hurling is an art as well as a skill, and many commentators claim that Christy Ring was the greatest player of all time. Listen to the old men talk around Cloyne in East Cork, admire the statue there to the great man, and you'll get some measure of his impact on Cork hurling. He inspired poetry and ballads, and even this calypso. Now all ye people who like the calypso and all who like to smile, I sing a song about a man, head man in the Emerald Isle. His name is Ring, and he is the thing when it comes to wielding the command. All the boys they say he is the greatest with Mackie the boy from a hand. One, two, and then rock. It's the funniest thing ever told. And we'll hear more of that calypso later in the program. In this morning's program, falling as it does between the hurling and football finals, we also hear from the archives part of Ian Corr's documentary series on the role which this station played in popularising Gaelic games. The series was entitled, This Game Is Not Over Yet, one of the regular lines in Michal O'Hare's commentary. A cue to listeners not to switch channels. Christy Ring to take it. Now will Christy try for a goal and put Cork into the battle? He tries a low hard shot and it's a goal! Yes, it's a goal for Cork and it's scored by Christy Ring. It's difficult for today's younger sports enthusiasts to appreciate just how lucky they are. They take live, satellite, colour television pictures for granted access to all the major sports events anywhere in the world. Later this morning we'll hear how 60 years ago their grandparents were bowled over by the first wireless sets bringing the excitement of a running commentary from Croke Park to groups of listeners gathered around the few radio receivers throughout the country. But first, uh, this week in which Cork celebrate being champions again, we hear from the archive some of the features which mark Christy Ring's greatness. First, Bill Toomey, a rugby commentator himself, introducing from the Cork studios a programme entitled Memories of Munster Sport and talking to Christy Ring. Out of all your matches, Christy, are there any which stand out? Well, Bill, I have memories, all right. Some good and some not so good. But uh, there are three things anyway I have reason to remember. One of them was the day we won and the other were two days we lost. We played Kilkenny in the 46 final and Billy Murphy was playing right full back for Cork and... Everybody in the field tried to score a point off a free, including myself. And nobody could make a job of it. So we got this free anyway, I said, about 110 years old. So Billy walked up coolly and faced up to the ball and drove a stay between the posts. I think that had a very steady effect on us in Kilkenny. We won the all that day anyway. So then 47, the following year, Jack Mulcahy was playing for Kilkenny against Cork again. And he was playing left half back. So he faced up to another ball, which I thought he had no hope of scoring. And he drove as a canal goal again, even though it was 12 months after, he still went just as far. And they beat us by a point. Paddy Stateland won the same in 49 against us in Limerick. He faced up to another ball. I saved it longer than either the other two, and against the wind. And he drove over the bar all the ways. And the player beat us. And uh, I don't expect ever to see anything better anyway. One broadcaster who did many interviews with Christy Ring, well, there's little surprise in this, was Donica O'Dooling. When Donica was growing up in Cork, these were the glory days of Cork hurling, undefeated for many years. And in this Highways and Byways interview with Donica,
Christy Ring spoke about how central hurling was to his life. I suppose hurling is something that was your is your whole life. It is. Uh, well, it, it's a thing I always uh, was interested in, and uh, I was kind. Uh, I, uh, you know, as I say, I put a lot of uh, work into it, and uh, I don't know whether I think I know more than anybody else about it, but I certainly uh, got a lot from it, really. You feel that it's meant a lot to you personally it meant over a the years? Lot, yes. It has meant a lot to me personally over the years. Mm. But, um, you know, there's always a time comes when you have to say, well, your family or your home has well, to be reckoned with as well. How did that moment come for you? Was it a gradual happening? It was a gradual happening. Do you remember any game as being your last game? I don't no. remember any game being my last game. How oft I've watched him from the hill move here, move there in grace. In Cork, Killarney, Tullus Town, or by the Shannon's race. Now Cork is bet the hay is saved, the thousands wildly sing. They speak too soon, my sweet garsoon, for here comes Christy Ring. Next, from the archives from the Sports Department, this evocation of Mihol O'Hare's contribution to the building up of the GAA. O'Hare and Ring both made their initial impact 60 years ago, at the beginning of the 1940s. And Packers, John Farron up here to this corner. Larry Guinan going for it, getting to it. Being tackled by Ty Kelly, getting it in a bit to Tom Cheesy. Cheesy lets it run through. Carl has it 14 yards out. He takes a shot, and it's the goal! I never met me all here in my life, except I say hello to him one time in Slag, what a kind of final. I never, I, that's the only time I ever saw him in life, even though he lives down the road. I, uh, maybe <laughs> he'd be in a big car, I'd be in cycling along. But uh, the thing about him is, sometimes, uh, you see, you go home to your landlady and you say, you might think the match was mediocre, you know. And you go home and the landlady said, that was a powerful, great game. And it wouldn't be that good a game, but he made it good for the listeners. Mihal O'Hare, even the name suggests excitement, a promise of drama, a guarantee of atmosphere. This is the late Sean O'Shea coin, acknowledging on this documentary programme the GAA's indebtedness to Mihal O'Hare. If Mihal was a painter, he would be of the Impressionist school. His images are not just those which he sees, but those that he wants his audience to see. And although the majority of the O'Hare broadcasts have been on radio, his supreme talent is that his listening audience does see the game. Maybe it's not exactly the game the attendance at the venue sees. Oh, the scores and the scorers are the same, the result is the same, but the game for the listening audience is different because Mihal O'Hare is playing in their game. And in that game there is argy-bargy, there are shamozzles and clashes of the ash, solo runs of 10, 20, 30 and 40 yards, and the game is not over until the final whistle blows. In the year that the GAA celebrates its centenary, it is an awesome fact that Mihal has broadcast the national games for almost half of those hundred years. And on this programme, Mihal O'Hare described his approach to doing a match running commentary. One terror that a commentator can get is the feeling that he is talking to thousands upon thousands of people. And this was something that struck me very soon after I had been told I was going to do a broadcast. And there was down in Clare, in a place called Ballycorrick, up on top of a hill, a man called Patrick Gary, who used to go all over the country to matches but of late had become stricken with arthritis and he couldn't travel anywhere. And for the first few years of broadcasting, I used to talk in commentaries to Patrick Gary. I didn't talk to the people in Ireland or anywhere else. I spoke to Patrick Gary, trying to tell him what was happening. And that way, somehow, it seemed to develop a style that the people liked. 
This style that was the essence of Michal's commentaries was to become an important part of the listening audience's perception of Gaelic games. In subsequent years, the live broadcast of the match was a central part of the Irish Sunday. Thousands of people throughout the country were connected to their national games by means of radio. One of these was the distinguished Abbey actor, Michal O'Brien. Uh, the first sports event I remember is the, an eyewitness account of the Kilkenny Tipperary All Ireland hurling final in, Kil, in Killarney. And uh, it was Sean, Sean O'Callaghan was, was giving the, 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 the broadcast. It was uh, uh, September 19, uh, 1937 in uh, Conlins, in um, Ballin in Spideo. I remember walking up the Boreen up to it with some farmers. I didn't know much about it, but they asked if they wanted to hear the, the results of the match at the time. And uh, some people were standing outside, outside at the uh, being a tea, the able end of the house. And anyway, we walked in, and uh, uh, it was about quarter to seven, or around seven o'clock. And uh, we went in, and uh, Tom Fortune, Tom was there, and Jim Fortune, Neddy, and oh, Patty uh, O'Donnell, and uh, Tom O'Hoe, and the lo local, uh, Lord of Mercy, they're nearly all dead now. And I saw this box. Oh, you know, I never thought, and <laughs> I, I thought it was the wonder of the Western world, you know, really. And uh, the, 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 the old people said, Oh, I'm going to go to the world, far he's a man a man down in Killarney, we can hear him here, you know. And it was one of the old radio sets with the dry battery and a wet battery, you see, and then the thing outside, the convents. Uh, I think there were only four four sets in the parish at the time, uh, the doctor or the master or uh, or the parish priest, but we wouldn't go to those houses, of course. I mean, this was an open house of kind of uh, uh, for everybody. Well, that was my first experience of, of radio, and I thought, right, I, I thought it was wonderful. A year later, the wonder was the same, but the voice was different. We went up anyway, went up to Condens again. A uh, crowd, it was an open house, door open and went in and into the parlous as they call it. It was crowded. And uh, a young voice came on the, on the radio, you see. We, uh, we had never heard before. We didn't hear anything that was, uh, there was going to be a new person on because we hadn't read the papers like, I mean, it was the uh, 14th of August, and, as I said. And this young voice came on and everybody kind of wondered who's this fella, you see. He gave his name, but it didn't mean, it didn't mean anything to us. Me all O'Hare didn't they mean a thing to us. I'm sure there was brave. He was only young kids, 16 years of age, uh, from, well, well, which we all know now, but we didn't know then. And uh, next thing, the first thing he gave us that score of the minor. That's the call we were badly beaten by Kerry. And the people were all staring at each other. Oh, yow, that's just a good hint. And, uh, Galway started off. It was tight enough going, you know. We were all mad, kind of mad uh, for Galway to win, naturally. And uh, things were going very well for us, but on occasions, there were, uh, one time we were leading by four, uh, four, four points at half time, and, and then ten points, but Moran came back at us. And the reaction, and the, the, this commentary, you know, like, I mean, he knew everything, little details he gave us that we never got before. Like, like, like we, we know now that he was the man that, mm, me, oh, he must have done his homework, you see, that he knew every, everything about every player and their background and how many county champions they had and many railway cups and oh what everybody was we were spellbound by this man this day and as the numbers owning wireless sets grew Michal O'Hare became part of the Irish Sunday it was like going to you went on a Sunday you got up early you went to uh, first mass if you and then you, 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 you got the paper and you said what matches is on or uh, the winter time very few matches on in those early days my goodness uh, railway cups maybe and and uh, maybe the national league would be on or fine last league final and uh, the uh, corner final or monster final is the final or the final you see and then they've got to see it it was a must if you're interested at all, I mean, it was nothing else, no matter what you were doing, I mean, you'd, you'd leave the bloody head there to go and listen to him, you know, or if you're going fishing or anything like that, you'd cancel everything. To you. This was only an hour and a half, and you had to listen to him. He said, it's part of life, it's the only life we had. 
What else had we in, 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 in the Gaelta or in the rural areas, the farmers or anything? You had the story one time about, uh, uh, Maureen de Grange was telling me about, uh, in Dunmore, 1938, replay, you see? Uh, um, Seamus O'Grange, I think he was in Dublin, he, was, he used to be a sub goalie for a call group one time, but there was a crowd of farmers in, in O'Grange's house, and they were around the, they were in the, in the, the, the Parlos, you see, you know, and uh, Brendan Nesta got a free in. And uh, this is the year, Kerry, you now, Kerry, the replay of Kerry and Kerry and Galway. Uh, <laughs> and when, when, when they heard uh, O'Hare saying it was free in, you know, the excitement in his voice, and they, they got them out of the, they stood up out of the chairs. They were sitting they moved to the set. And a big farmer came and he gave them a show back. He said, get back to hell with that, give the man a chance. You see it? <laughs> that, that's what they, he, he got them going, you know. It wasn't Ness. They couldn't see Ness, but they, they, they could. But was, O'Hare was getting them going, you know. He, he, got, he got them moving. Christie ring to take it. Now will Christie try for a goal and put Cork into the battle? He tried the low hard shot and it's a goal. Yes, it's a goal for Cork and it's scored by Christie ring. And this is Paddy Carey's ballad on Christie Ring. great run of successes in hurling began just 60 years ago in September 1939. That first weekend in September that year was historic for other reasons too. The match was played just as the Second World War broke out. Jack Lynch, later to be Taoiseach, was a distinguished member of the Cork team during the 1940s and in this archive interview he spoke to Mick Dunn about the 1939 final. It was one of those days that we remember for a lot of reasons, I suppose. The fact that the main reason is that it had been Cork's first final since 1931, and we've been looking forward to it for, for a long time. And um, strange enough, uh, without um, diverting too much, uh, it had something in common with the current one, but the la- uh, this year's All Ireland final, because we went to see Kilkenny playing a few of our, the team, Galway, in Burr in the semi final, and we thought we were well over them, and we went out. Uh, I certainly with near confidence, if not with complacency, but uh, the usual happened, we were beaten by a point. But uh, I remember it uh, for a lot of reasons. First of all, we were brought out to a hotel in Monkstown the night before in order to get us away from the Madding throng. And uh, it was the Salted Hotel, now no longer existent in existence. The following morning, when we went to Mass in Monkstown Parish Church, and it was lashing rain. We went on to Crow Park then, it was still raining, and during the course of the day, I think the sun came out uh, brilliantly, hailstones fell, the thunder and lightning, of course, and we were beaten by the proverbial, proverbial point by Kilkenny. But what are your memories of the thunder and lightning? Was it as bad as uh, people now write about it? I mean, it seems to have been a ferocious storm. It was, it was a raging storm. And the rain came down, as I say, like stair rods. At some time, some bouts of the pit, it was very hard to see, more than about 20 yards away from you. So in fact, at some stage, the, the conditions were unplayable, were they? Almost unplayable. And as I've mentioned, in Europe, World War II was just beginning that weekend. And that had prompted the declaration of the emergency by the then Taoiseach, Eamon de Valera. That's right. And there's, in fact, um, I believe Mr. de Valera called a special meeting of uh, the Doyle either that morning or the, the day before. I remember some of my former TD colleagues mentioning that the meeting was over soon enough to come to Crow Park. But, they, uh, got, they got the priorities right. <laughs> got the priorities right. Uh, but as it happened, uh, it, uh, the catastrophe, though, the war was somehow the 
greater catastrophe for me anyway happened in Croke Park that day. Well, I suppose even the spectators, uh, they wouldn't have been conscious of the catastrophe that the war was going to turn out to be. It wouldn't have looked to be. Ah, uh, no, it didn't, of course. It was probably one of those things, and we hadn't had war for, what, since 1918? That was 20 years, and I, I suppose nobody expected there would be a repetition of the 1914-18 war. But then the catastrophe it did happen uh, somehow did impinge on our minds afterwards because it made uh, hurling and travelling to hurling matches very difficult. And one thing it, it it happened or it caused for us was a cancellation of a tour to America, yes. which we were to be given whether we won or lost. So, in fact, um, none of that team team ever got to America on a tour. In fact, I think Kerry got out and were very nearly caught, uh, as far as I can remember. Well, no, I, I, can't, I, I can't remember that. But in, uh, And the emergency years, as they're called, they were the years of your great four in a row, so the travel was restricted and people were going on bicycles and all Oh, I remember, and uh, I, I think um, the attendances were notwithstanding very, very high. I often passed scores of fellows between the road from Cork to Limerick and Cork to Thurlis, and when I was living in Dublin, from Dublin to Thurlis. And a funny thing, in those days, uh, one was entitled to travel in a taxi. If, and they even included going uh, participants in games, yes. but nobody else. And I remember driving from Dublin to Thurles in a taxi, all by myself, <laughs> and some of my friends, my colleagues on the civil service holding team, many of them Cork people, actually cycling. I passed some of them around Port Leisha and they were sitting on my glory, which is a silly thing, you know. Mm -hmm. There was no reason why they shouldn't have sat in with me if I was permitted to go. The same amount of petrol being wasted. <laughs> yes. Of course, then there was the famous pony and trap and all those. I mean, nobody thought uh, any the worse of going to a match in a pony and trap. Well, the, one of the first games I ever played, it was in a hearty cup match and uh, it was in Charleville and the, the railway station in Charleville there was a good distance away I was playing with North Monastery at the time which had been in the middle 30s and all the Charleville boys came to the station and drove us the two miles into, into Charleville <laughs> to play the game and uh, it, it was a great memory Jack Lynch and we conclude this morning with this unlikely musical tribute to Christy Ring there are many ballads written about famous moments in the history of Gaelic games but although the Calypso is a ballad style its rhythms are West Indian, and one expects the singer to be praising what we might call a foreign game, some great feat on the cricket field. Not so here. With Dermot Kelly's Calypso, we close. Until next Saturday morning, thank you for listening. Good morning. Now all ye people who like the Calypso and all who like to smile, I sing a song about a man, head man in the Emerald Isle. His name is Ring, and he is the thing when it comes to wielding the command. All the boys, they say, he is the greatest wit, Mackie the boy from a hand. One, two, and then rock. It's the funniest thing ever told, the day that Christy Ring gave up the rumba to do the rock and roll. In the village of Klein, when the weather was fine, a little boy was born. All the people were away, some were making the hay, and some were cutting the corn. But his mummy was happy, so was his pappy, they both turned to the start. And they said, wrap that guy up in red, because he's going to huddle with heart. One, two, and then run. It's the funniest thing ever told, the day that Christy Ring gave up the rumba to do the rock and roll. He grew up strong, and it was not very long before he made his mark. And every time that Ringy wielded his command, you sure could see the spark. When during the war, a plane over Klein was about to bomb the town. Ringy got his command and his leather ball, and he shot the jerry plane down. One, two, and then rock. It's the funniest thing ever told The day that Christy Ring Gave up the rumba To do the rock and roll Christy went to the USA And he got a baseball bat And Babe Ruth he 
say Though you stay for the day You will never master that But Ringy said, boy I'm telling you no lie Just bitch at me one a ball And when they did He nearly knocked up the lid And it landed on the car town hall One, two, and then run It's the funniest thing ever told The day the Christie ring Gave up the rumba to do the rock and roll This little song could be very long But why not make a point If there's anyone here who thinks that Ringy is finished He'd better leave the joint He's already won it, he won't be bit As sure as you hear this tune He's training like mad to be the first lad To huddle to come on on the moon One, two, and then run It's the funniest thing ever told The day that Christy Ring gave up the rumba To do the rock and roll One, two, and then rock It's the funniest thing ever told The day that Christy Ring gave up the rumba To do the rock and roll That programme was presented and produced by John Bowman. Bowman Saturday 8.30 will be repeated tomorrow morning in the Irish Collection at 4 a.m. Good morning and welcome to this week's programme. An addition to mark the build-up to next weekend's All-Ireland Hurling Final from the archives of Portrait in Sand of the legendary hurler, Christy Ring. Christy Ring, growing up in Cloyne, the school teacher who brought hurling back to Cloyne and who first spotted Ring's talent. Jack Lynch on Ring as a teammate in the 1940s. The Ring legend celebrated in the Calypso and other songs, tribute to him when he died, and Christy Ring on his own love of hurling. Christy Ring, the greatest legend in hurling, the Stanley Matthews of hurling, the Don Bradman, the Babe Ruth. Just as Don Bradman was the Christy Ring of cricket, Stanley Matthews, the Christy Ring of soccer, Babe Ruth, the Christy Ring of baseball. Christy Ring to take it. Oh, will Christy try for the goal and put Cork into the back? He tries a little hard shot, but it's a goal! Come count it all, both great and small, who boast a hurling king, can one tonight hold candlelight to Cork's own Christie ring. Brian McMahon, and he's a carry man, Brian McMahon's ballad, tribute to Christie ring. Con Murphy, then president of the GAA, spoke about Christie ring in 1979, when he died. There was no man, I suppose, over a career, uh, with his great skill and artistry and all the excitement he created on the field of play, uh, enthused so many people for so long for hurling and won so much admiration for his exceptional achievements. There was probably nobody made as big an impact on Irish sport as he did. Why do you think that was so? Well, I think the man himself was so dedicated, committed. He was, he had that charisma in himself that attracted people and I have no doubt that there's many a person went to see our games because of the fact that he was playing at all and I think his impact over the years is immeasurable from the point of view of uh, his own personal unexpected contribution, might I describe it as that, during any game. Everybody was expecting of him to do something particular to make the day worthwhile, and he never failed them. Now, you played with him in the famous four in a row. What was he like as a competitor? Well, first of all, he was a great motivator for his companions. You saw in him a man that was so dedicated, so committed to the game in hand, making such a study of it, weighing up everything to the final point of what he himself was going to do, that you yourself were in some small way trying to measure up to his leadership, to his motivation, and it got the best out of every fellow, and he did something during the game as well to rally forces, which meant a lot to our team at that time and to future teams after that time too, and meant a lot to young people that he was playing with. Uh, I have no doubt. And what was he like then as an opponent? Well, as you know, he was a real handful. And more than a handful for a humble player like me. As you know, he beat the best in Ireland 
And but at the same time, somehow, even as an opponent, because of the qualities of the man, you play that little bit better to try and measure up to him, which I think was a great tribute to him. A year before his death, Christy Ring spoke to Donnacho Dooling on highways and byways. Well, the local people are always a great help. You know, I was always very happy with them, with uh, with my schoolmates and, you know, the people from the street. I'd say that um, I never had any great ambitions about playing hockey. I just played for the love of the game. And uh, I was, I, I always maintained that I was a terribly lucky player. Exceptionally lucky. Because uh, very few trophies evaded me. And uh, to win three all um, to well, the captain three all um, winning team is something that, uh, you know, it comes by chance, really. Well, of course, Christie's love of hurling in particular, you know, is hard to measure. It. Con Murphy again. He talked hurling every day, he lived hurling, and he loved hurling. And he loved to see people playing hurling. His anxiety was, as a player that had honored the game by playing it, was to get as many playing it as he could and that they could lift their standards to anything like his own. He would wish it. Christy Ring was born in 1920 and there was little tradition of hurling in his native Cloyne in East Cork as he was growing up. Cloyne's tradition of hurling was very poor, you know, in the division. Because even though we had great hurlers, we never had a club. Then a new teacher came to the school, Jerry Moynihan. 1933, there was one wandering around the country doing subs for two years. He very had to get a job at that time. The new teacher decided he would organize a hurling club for the boys. They uh, met the boys at school and uh, they were very anxious about hurling. I got some hurlies, but then there was no field. I asked my principal where could we get a field and he told me that there was one field out the road about a half a mile called the Gruenine and that we could possibly get that. Mr. Creed of Town, who was a great horse breeder, owned the field, so I approached him, told him who I was, and I must say this, that he was very gracious and thought he was delighted to have the privilege of allowing us to play in the field. So I took the children out a few evenings, a couple of evenings a week or more, and I immediately started Christie. As a matter of fact, I came in if I dig, and I told the chap who was saying to dig, that when you fell out there, Lord, he's going to be a star. Christy Ring to take it. Now will Christy try for a goal and put Cork into the back of He tried the low hard shot, but it's a goal! Jerry Moynihan, in this archive interview, again from Highways and Byways, told Donnacle Dooling what impressed him about the young schoolboy, Christy Ring. Two things struck me. Number one, watching him hitting a rolling ball. He connected with that ball as the ball just left the ground and then got some maximum uh, force into it. Now, he did this without knowing it. It was just, it was just uh, a gift. And number two was his determination. And I think determination is needed, especially for inter-county uh, games. Then you came along and you set up street leagues and Christie was very active yes. in this. Quite right. We um, Eventually formed a club, and we formed, there were four streets in Klein, Rock Street, River Street, uh, Chapel Street, and Church Street. And we formed, I got, we got four teams going, and Christy was one of them, in, in uh, uh, Chapel Street. And played a league, I got a cup for the winners, and there was nearly almost too much interest in the league because the parents took a very active or overactive part of it. Christie was very active himself too. He was a star of course of his streets and uh, a most determined young kid at that time. I'm sure he'd be about 13 then. Uh, so much so that I was I always refereed the games and not quite an easy job to do then. But I remember some days that Christie didn't agree with my decisions and he let me know fairly and squarely that he didn't agree. And you could see his determination there even again. Yeah. Now, as a minor, you were also instrumental in helping him onto the court. Well, I was. People said that I did a lot for Christian, that I helped him on a team and made a hold of him, but that was all wrong in the sense that it would have been a greater achievement to stop him from being a hold of him than to make a hold of him. 
1938, he was, he was playing with our junior team. We won the East Cork Championship. We had no minor team, but he did play with Middleton and ended the Middleton at that time. But he was quite unknown to the Cork County Board. And um, I contacted Seamus Long, who was more or less in charge of the Cork Miners, and taught him about Christie's, uh, Christie's potential and where they should play him. And I did ask him specially to give him a chance of taking sideline box because I watched Christie for the years down along and I think that he was as good then at the age of 17 as he ever was at was in his heyday at taking the sideline box. I remember the match quite well. Limerick, the car, and 10 minutes to go, I was watching it, Limerick 6-2, Cork 2-2. Now, Ted Sullivan, who was a great Cork full forward afterwards, was full forward that day also for the minors. Cork started to press the second half, and Limerick sent a good few balls across the sideline. Christie took him, and he actually went across from one wing to the other wing to take sideline balls. Three balls in a row, they, he landed 70 yards, or 65 to 70 yards, into the cock goal or to the Limerick goal mark. Now the defence stood the usual 25 or 30 yards away and each time Christie locked the ball over him. Ted Sullivan had the habit of always standing on the on the line of the square, no matter where the backs were. And he got three balls in a row into a stand and got three goals in the space of about four or five minutes. And one other ball from Christie came into another power to score again. And the result of the game was that left Cock won by one point. Christie Ring inspired ballads and verse. Even this Calypso by Dermot Kelly. Now all ye people who like the Calypso and all who like to smile I sing a song about a man head man in the Emerald Isle his name is Ring, and he is the thing when it comes to wielding the command. All the boys, they say, he is the greatest with Mackie the boy from a hand. One, two, and then rock. It's the funniest thing ever told. The day that Christy Ring gave up the rumba to do the rock and roll. In the village of Klein, when the weather was fine, a little boy was born. All the people were away, some were making the hay, and some were cutting the corn. But his mummy was happy, so was his happy. They both turned to the start, and they said, wrap that guy up in red, because he's going to huddle with heart. Hey, that 
doesn't leave the joint. He's already won it. He won me bid. As sure as you hear this tune, he's grinning like mad. The bit of first lad, the hurly come on on the moon. Those who played with Christy Ring on the great All Ireland winning Cork teams of the 1940s was future Thesius Jack Lynch. Ring had a, 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 a great um, brain like that, a man of great intellect, unfortunately, not very much education, because I never saw a sharper brain in my life off the field, not necessarily on the field. So I tried to be handed a chance of education, you know, got very far in business life as well as in, uh, in the sporting life. Did but you like hurling with him? I did. I was lucky in that, and I never had to play against him. Because he played with them over with Cork and the occasions I played with Monster with Monster, so I never played against him. But I came against I came up against him in training and he was very hard. He was only about to say in the song, although he's middling small, he's the daddy of the all. but he's about five foot nine, I suppose. But every muscle and bone was hard on him and his hands I never saw a bigger hand in my life. If I put my two hands together, well, they'd be about mm. five one third of one hand over the surface of another, he wrote the size of, of, of 50 rings hands, and his wrists, of course, are powerful. He had utter belief in himself, had he? Absolutely. And I, I think more than anything else, Ring uh, believed, first of all, that, it, that hurling was the only thing that was a worthwhile, and that there was nobody able to beat him in hurling, which was true. But he had utter belief in himself, and I saw many instances of it. Christie tried for a goal and put Cork into the battle. He tried the low hard shot and it's a goal. I tell you, I had great confidence in myself from the point of view with the hurley. That if it came my way, I could deal with it. Christy Ring from his last major interview with Donoghue Dooley. That's uh, the difference. That, that helps a lot before the game. It takes a lot of um, worry from you when you realise you're good with the, with the stick. Would you have uh, sized up your opponent to the following day? I mean, would you? I like would, I would, but I would, yeah, but I, I wouldn't. Uh, it wouldn't affect my own game at any time. At any time, no. I'd still play the game. You know, I think you have to have a lot of. Uh, I tell you, what, to play games, you have to have a great sense of humour, and you you must see the the the, the good points in your opponent as well as uh, well. The uh, points, you you so. brought me to that. Now you certainly needed a sense of humour because. From an early on, you were considered to be the player. You were a marked man in every sense of the word. Yes. How did you cope with this, just mentally with this? I cope with it, as I said, physically. I believed I was strong. And, uh, you know, when you have a certain amount of strength, there's nothing anyone can do to you. Nothing. Because you have, in other words, you have the power. And uh, I had a sense of humor that when the thing went against me, I, 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 I knew it went against me. And, uh, you know, I'd always give my opponent credit for how good he was. So if he was better than me, I'd admit it to myself and I would do something about it then. I certainly wouldn't leave it go. Again, you try to do the impossible, like Oh, yes, yes. Uh, tis, tis, uh, you can't play the game too serious. And, you know, when the game is over, there's no point in having post-mortems or, 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 you know, bad feelings because that's what the game is all about, friends. As I said early on here, there's, I have great friends here now in Klein, and they were always a great help to me. And, you know, I, I was always very happy in Klein. You come back here very often. I do, every Saturday. And I like I, the fellas I went to school with and played with, they're still my best friends. Why do you come back here every Saturday? Because I was attaching them to it. My, all my sisters and brothers are here, and, you know, I always feel that um, in hurling, like that, we put. I'd say the lads of 1946-47, and as I said, they put hurling on the map in front. 
We had no tradition before that. We had some tradition, but we wouldn't, we couldn't, uh, like, uh, they were always interested, but they never win. But, um, as I said, this, I got more uh, enjoyment from the older fellows in their lives. That, you know, they had put up with their share for a while until we came. And when we came, it was just the same as if they did it was their success. I suppose hurling is something that was your, is your home, right? It is. Uh, well, it, it's a thing I always uh, was interested in. And uh, I was kind of, uh, I, uh, you know, as I say, I put a lot of uh, work into it. And uh, I don't know whether I think I know more than anybody else about it, but I certainly uh, got a lot from it. You feel that it's meant a lot to your personal It meant a lot, yeah. It has meant a lot to me personally over the years. Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, there's always a time comes when you have to say, well, your family or your home has what? to be reckoned with as well. How did that moment come for you? Was it a gradual happening? It was a gradual happening. Well, I got married and of course my wife is a... She's not a great hurling fan and, you know, She's a great help to me too. She doesn't interfere with what I'm doing. And um, I said that's the big factor. Do you remember any game as being your last game? I don't no. remember any game being my last game. How oft I've watched him from the hill move here, move there in grace. In Cork Killarney, tallest town, are by the Shannon's race. Now Cork is bet the hay is saved, the thousands wildly sing. Speak too soon, my sweet garçon, for here comes Christy Ring. When he died in 1979, another legend, his career began at the same time, another legend broadcast from Mihol O'Hare, paid Christy Ring this tribute. It's hard to believe that Ringy is gone. But those of us who grew up alongside this great hurler and enjoyed every moment of his hurling brilliance, he will always be a wonderful memory. I first saw Christy when he played in the... All Ireland minor final in 1938. He played for Cork, I needn't say, and he was brilliant. Then there was the automatic move on to the senior ranks, those eight All Irelands and, of course, the 18 Railway Cup medals. But my memories of Christie will not be as the medal winner, but as the man who put magic into hurling. A man who made hurling a game for people to go along and see in the 50s and also in the 40s. And when history is recorded about the part that Christy Ring played in Irish sport, I think he'd be always remembered as Mr. Hurling. Paddy Carey has the last word in song. <laughs>
Texas from the archives at the same time on Saturday morning next. Thank you for listening this morning and good morning. Because of the 90th anniversary of Jack Lynch's birth, we included in recent weeks quite a bit about hurling, but mainly about cork hurling. And as is well known, they are not in this year's All-Ireland Final. But I thought that Fisherin, as a hurler, had a great, greater repertoire than McMackey had, while McMackey was probably one of the most effective hurlers I ever met in my life. And that was the verdict of Jack Lynch, although he insisted many times in that interview that it had to be a highly subjective opinion. This year's final, today's final, is between Kilkenny and Limerick. We've been listening back through the archives to hear from two of the greatest players from each county, both of them incidentally included on the GAA team of the millennium, as indeed Jack Lynch and Christy Ring were also included on that team. First, Jimmy Langton from Kilkenny. How many All-Ireland medals, seniors, did you win, Jim? Only two, really. 39 and 37. 39 was the Thunder and Lightning final, wasn't it? Uh, what's your memory of that one? Today. The day the war broke out, you know, and uh, the thunder and lightning that fell the same day just came down in buckets. Of course, it was a ding-dong struggle all the way. Cork tried the roughmost, I'd say, in the last seven or eight minutes to look for that score, which didn't come, which I'd say they were in very hard luck. What about the 47 final then against Cork? Much the same, I mean, trying all the way, couldn't get there, just hard luck again on Cork, I would say. What was your most enjoyable game? I, I would say at 39, it was my first senior all and it was something to be always looking forward to, and just when the match was over, you couldn't believe you had won. Jim, what is your opinion of the standard of hurling generally in Ireland today? Well, I'd say the standard of hurling is as good as it ever was, but I'd say there's not as many players. Down in Kilkenny, you know, it's mostly the lift and strike business, and it, that's still the way... Of that's, that's still the way they're going to play their game. Is a hurler born or made? Yeah, I'd say he's born. He? And is that why we don't have hurling in some parts of the country at all? Well, it probably is. And then, of course, a lot of the country is all football, and they are going well in football. They forget about the hurlers. And I would say that if they took a little more interest in their... A lot of the county boards took a little more interest in their hurlers, they'd make it the grade as well as any other county. You obviously wouldn't consider hurling a far better game than football. A much faster game, me. And a more skillful game? A more skillful. What about the great players you've seen in your day and played against and played with, perhaps? Well, of course we do. We had great players here. Uh, Paddy Phelan, Laurie Maher, the Bourbons, the Larkins. I could go on forever mentioning them. There's one man always sticks out in my, my, in my memory, and he's not a any man at all. It's Mick Mackey, I mean. Oh, he was a wonderful player. He put up with an awful lot of heart, but took it all in the best of spirits. And uh, I'd say he was one of the best players I've ever seen play. It was Liam Campbell talking to Jimmy Langton, and next we hear an archive interview with the great Mick Mackey. The interviewer is Jimmy McGee. Mick Mackey, in 21 years of senior hurling, what give you your greatest thrill? Well, uh, my greatest thrill was in winning the 1934 All-Ireland. It was the Jubilee year, and it was, uh, it was my first All-Ireland. We had been beaten in 33, so it was a great thrill to win in 34 after a replay against Dublin. Any but great disappointments in your life in hurling? Well, not really. We had a uh, great run. Uh, we had uh, with good luck and bad luck. But I mean, on, on uh, the whole, we had uh, fairly good innings. Why? Have you any theory about why this particular period was the golden era of Limerick hurling, and why has it gone down now? Well, uh, I suppose uh, we got a great bu bunch together at the right time. They all seemed to come at the right time, and at that particular time, the hurling was in in in, in all the counties in Munster and and in Leinster. Uh, it was of a high standard. It wasn't, it wasn't easy to get out of Munster at that time. You were lucky to survive the first round. Do you think that the youngsters of today haven't quite as much interest? Oh, I don't think they have the same interest as we had anyhow. Mick Mackey, many people said that in your heyday, you used to get away with a little trick of running with the ball without actually playing it on the hurley on a solo run. Is this true or false? Uh, you'll hear a lot of stories, but you may, you may trick a referee once or twice, but you won't get away with it all the time. Do I take it from that that you're admitting you did it? Oh, I did a bit of it, I suppose, I like. About forwards, who would you like to play with in a forward line? If you could get your ideal forward line, any particular names you'd like to have in it? Well, I don't know. I suppose you'd have ring anywhere. Langton, if you can. We had Johnny Powell, who was in my time. Mm -hmm. 
Oh, sure. I don't know. I know it's hard to think of. Hard to think of. I'm just thinking to be a fellow called Nick Mackey in there in the middle of them too. Nick, what? How does hurling today compare with hurling in your day? Is it better, or worse, or just about the same? I uh, will. I say. I say. To the standard was higher in our time, and even before our time, it seems in the twenties. 20s to the 30s and the 30s to the 40s, the standard was high and very high, definitely high. When did it start going down and why? I think it started from about 1940, I couldn't say why. It was, uh, went down, uh, it started going in each county, and in the counties in general it started to go. It went to Limerick actually, definitely in the 40s. They were never able to get back into a drive. Mick, had you any regrets from the game? Did you ever get any knocks that you didn't really fancy? Uh, I got a few strokes here and there, but and the overall, no. I, I was very lucky. And finally, Mick Mackey, a wish for the future. If you had a wish for the future in sport, what would it be? Well, I'd like to see Limerick win the Nile Island. Well, that's to be decided this afternoon. We'll conclude with a subject which, from listening to many hours of material, the subject which Jack Lynch preferred to talk about more than politics, hurling. Here he is with Donald O'Dooling on the All-Ireland final weekend of 1989, talking about a game which he loved. What do you think, uh, Jack Lynch, is it about hurling that makes people want to talk about it like we are now? I suppose, but number one, uh, it's ingrained in us. It's the oldest game in Ireland. Uh, I believe, even though I'm not going to pr pretend that my judgment is objective, it's the, the greatest field game in the world. Of course, back to the mythological times, who called him whether he had a golden hurley and, and or a brass hurley, whatever it was, and a golden ball, I don't know. I wouldn't like to be playing with those myself, because you can't beat the ash. And then these, even that, that very phrase, the ash, the clash of the, the ash. clash of the ash. Uh, and, uh, you know, the hitting a ball overhead on the ground, or overhead and on the ground, and uh, quick movement. And the fact that in the old days people were able to fashion their, their commands out of uh, hedgerows and things like that. And th th this it's close to nature. As and to it's, it's a totally indigenous game. And um, I hope it'll expand. It is great to see teams like Offaly, you know, again, Antrim coming up. I was at Cork Park there a few years ago in the, um, the uh, juvenile competition, and uh, I, took, I saw some teams from Derry doing very well. Mm. Galway, of course, weren't strong in my time, but I do, I would dearly like to see Aunt Clare and Limerick and Galway coming back, and of course Wexford in hurling. They, they had a great... Well, still brought mm. a good deal to the game, didn't they? Oh, they did indeed. Again, there was, there was, there was this, this wholesomeness, uh, yeah. uh, and, and strength uh, and you know there the, the was a vigor a vibrancy about the game in those days as she well. had dynamism, dynamism absolutely the and uh, for the boys of Wexford that kind of thing it stirs a fellow's blood <laughs> I'm sure if I were from Wexford in those days I'd, uh, it's I'd hard for a county thing. that has won a lot to be down for a long time like tip 1971 yes I was time. I was thinking as I was coming over in the car this morning uh, is it um, 17 years 71 as 17 was 18 years <laughs> now there are team, there are, most of the team who are playing don't wouldn't on for tip tomorrow. I won't even remember tip winning in All Ireland, and most of the lads, say the fifteen and sixteen year olds, who will be in Tenterhooks tomorrow, uh, it will be a bit like, like history for them to, to hear about Tip really winning All Ireland because you know history becomes very attenuated when. <laughs> You're 15 or 16. I mean. Do you enjoy sitting in Crow Park? I do, matches? I do. I enjoy it. And <clears throat> what's more, I can detach myself from the desire to get in and play. Because I'm certainly not on to money or in glee. I, I know that I, the only reason I prefer to be in there would be if Cork were playing in a tense match, because the tension can wear off easily, more easily in, on the pitch than on the sideline. But certainly I never had any desire to, to, to want to be in there because I felt I could do better and I knew I wouldn't uh, on in years anyway. But I, I love going to see. I love watching the, the skills. I don't like some of the skills that are developing this the tendency to catch the ball too frequently. And, and the hand pass. And the hand pass. I, 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 I'd allow only one hand pass outside of, in, the, in the course of play who might be in trouble and pass to a, to a man who's free. I'd oblige him to, to deliver the ball with his hurley, or with his boot for that matter. But I certainly would disallow any scores with the hand, because the forward, the goalkeeper and back had no, no chance. And it's all about the come on anyway. Come on, and, and there's nothing better than to see a fellow flying, hitting. You might shorten the grip on the stick, shorten the stick with your grip, mm -hmm. and tap it over the bar. But that's, that's hurling. 
the other thing is only handball. Jack Lynch is remembered as one of the greatest hurlers. He captained the Cork hurling teams of 1939, 1940 and 1942 and was on the winning team, the All-Ireland winning team in 1941, 42, 43, 44 and 1946. Did he miss out in 1945? Well, yes, but to compensate, he was a winner that year of an All-Ireland Gaelic football medal with Cork. And before he died, Jack Lynch made a donation to the GAA Museum of his hurling memorabilia. Con Murphy, his old teammate, was invited to that private dinner. Well, as everybody knows, uh, Jack went on to an eminent career in, at the bar as a lawyer and, of course, became the highly respected politician that he was for many years in our country. The one thing that I always feel saddened about, and I'm sure many uh, other people did as well, is that he hadn't the opportunity for long to enjoy the fruits of his labor and his career at the end of his time when his health broke down a little. But he still was a man of great courage, never allowed uh, his health to, to interfere with his normal living if he could manage it. And one of the really grateful memories I have of, of Jack is in that situation, in failing health, he decided to hand over all his wonderful trophies and which portray the history of his achievements to the GA National Museum in Parker Crokey. And Maureen, his good wife, who we almost always must regard as so supportive of him and so helpful to him during his career, and particularly during his illness, invited Liam O'Milverhill, the Archduke of Hore of Common Low Class Gale, the great Glen Rose man, Liam O'Tuma, and myself to his home in Dublin uh, for the official handing over of his trophies uh, to the National Museum. And as he handed over that wonderful array of trophies, it will always live with me. I never saw Jack emotional in his life, despite having known him for 40 years or more, until that occasion. And I will always remember his final remarks, which were rather conclusive, I suppose, to a great career and the lifetime of a great man. He said to Liam O'Melverhill as he handed over the trophy, Take good care of them, he said. They were hard. We turn next to a politician, the 90th anniversary of whose birth falls next week, Jack Lynch. Twice Taoiseach, the third leader of Fianna Fáil and the last leader of the party to win an overall majority, and that was 30 years ago in the 1977 election. Before his political career blossomed, and we'll be dealing with his political career next week, he had been an outstanding sportsman, representing his native court, winning a record six All-Ireland medals in succession, five in hurling, and one in football. Well, we weren't well off. My father was a tailor, uh, and he did a lot of what they call merchant tailoring in his own right, but he had a job as well. Um, my mother used to help him out. She was a, what they call, I suppose, a seamstress in those days. And um, by standards around the place, around the Shandon area, uh, Shandon Street, we were pretty well off, even though that was only the main income. My mother's income was very much supplementary. But we had a happy childhood. We had um, uh, a lot of close friends naturally around the area. We had cousins living within the Stones Row or Donahue's, and uh, all our neighbours were very close. There seemed to be, as far as I know, there was never any bickering. And then, uh, being close to Shandon, we were living near the little nucleus of the Protestant community there because we had the old school. The, uh, the National School was there, Bob and Jones, they call it. Oh, yeah. The teachers, to name the Batemans, the Sexton Bellies, and behind them was Old Skiddy's home, where, which is a geriatric place uh, endowed by a, a former wealthy Cork person named Skiddy. Jack Lynch grew up in Cork City, within earshot of the bells of Shandon. Well, I was born in Shandon, just beside Shandon's people in Cork, and uh, there was a lane running down through, beside Shandon, through the graveyard and it was a quiet way because there were steps at one end about 30 or 40 steps so there was no through traffic so we were able to play games and it was mainly hurling up and down at least it was only about probably 20 feet wide and probably about 50 or 60 feet long up and down that way and uh, so we they, I had three elder brothers mm -hmm. uh, each of whom played hurling 
the home my eldest brother played with Ken Rover seniors, Charlie we both since dead, played with Farron Paris in college and Finn Barb was my next eldest and he played with me in the North Monastery so the hurling was in the family because uh, my father was from Bantry so he hadn't much knowledge of hurling but Nessa, he became interested but he, when he came to Cork he played with an old Cork team now defunct Gaelic football Nil Desperandum known as the Nils mm. so um, and then my father also being a Bantry man used to go bowling up around Fair Hill and brought a couple of us up to space so he wouldn't lose his balls. So you had the whole... You had the so whole you had the whole gamut of... of, of, of yeah. And then, of course, going to North Monastery. There's nothing else you could do but play hurling in the North Monastery. Do you think the brothers were important to hurling? Oh, they were. They were tremendously important. We had some great mentors in the North Mon. Um, Brother Lawler, who died later, I think, in Argentina. Brother Malone, Brother O'Brien, Brother McConville, Brother Moynihan. All dead now. But they were men of tremendous interest. And, of course, being brothers, they could stay back after school every day. And we had a little field just between the, the brothers' residence and the secondary school. It wasn't a very good field, but it was handy for hurling and knocking a ball around and for jumping around. And then, of course, being uh, in the, uh, what might you call the catchment area of Glen Rovers, it was inevitable. How did they approach skills? Did they try to teach you these? Uh, no, indeed, except, um, no, I think, I don't ever remember any uh, of the brothers teaching us any skills, uh, except Brother Malone, he was a Limerick man, and his motto was, pull soon and pull fast. <laughs> Let's keep the ball moving, and there's no reason pulling when the ball is gone. But otherwise, I think, well, I suppose their skills were inherent in most of the young fellows in school in my day. He first became famous as a sportsman, and he played both Gaelic codes, football, but especially hurling. Cork had had a lean period, as you probably know, since 1931, the day of the, the year of the three finals. Cork won on the secondary play against Kilkenny. So in between, we had a very lean period. We beat a good Limerick team in the Munster final, 1939. And uh, we were straight into the final from then, because there was no other, no other. I think Galway were playing against Kilkenny in the semi-final. Mm -hmm. So we are straight into the final. We thought we had a good team and we had every hope of winning it. But it wasn't to be. They won by the traditional point. And were you captain on that day? Yes, I was captain that day. So it was, a, in effect, a, a double disappointment to me because in, in Cork, as in other counties, the county champions usually provide the captain if they have a man on the team. And Glen Rovers had several on that team and I happened to be captain of Glen Rovers at that time. It was also, of course, the time when a world war was breaking out all over. Yes, indeed. Although we weren't... Uh, a really conscious of the war clouds and uh, we had read vaguely about the Hitler's invasion of Poland and we had naturally been hearing the news and de Valera's voice coming over and warning about, you know, that times were getting very dangerous. You know from the news bulletins to which you have been listening that the great European powers are again at war. But the actual day war broke out, we weren't really conscious of it because uh, Tuss Chamberlain declared war we hadn't heard his radio broadcast. I have to tell you now that no such undertaking has been received and that consequently this country is at war with Germany. And I suppose it's all cynical to say it now, uh, that, but it seemed to be a secondary consideration to us at the time. You were trying to beat Kilkenny. Trying church. to beat Kilkenny and they, it had another uh, I I significance that day too because they called it the Thunder and Lightning Final because we had all enemies that day. In the morning it was lashing rain. We were staying out in the Salt Hill Hotel outside of Dublin which was a new departure trying to get the team away from the crowds. Then we came in, it was, we went to Mass out in, in Monkstown and it was really lashing rain. Then it cleared up and we went into Cork Park for a beautiful day. Again the heavens opened. We had every kind of weather. I, as far as I remember, we almost had sleet, I think, that day. We certainly had thunder and lightning. And Kilkenny had the one point. The one point scored by a man named Jimmy Kelly in the last minute. The ball was poked out after that, and that was the end. Where were you playing on that team? I was right half forward. Jack Barrett from Kinsale mm -hmm. and Sonny Buckley, or Connie Buckley from the Glenwood midfield. I was up marking one of the best players of all time that day, Paddy Freedom. Um, he was left half back for, for mm -hmm. Kilkenny, so it was... A double baptism in fire flipped from the heavens and Paddy Phelan's hurling and Kilkenny's skills. So we certainly remember the day, especially having been beaten. What did it feel like being captain of Cork for the first time? It, well, I regard it as naturally uh, an honour. Uh, but somehow in Gaelic games, in my time anyway, 
it was only really the man who tossed the coin. We had really no influence on the field. And I often regretted that I didn't have more influence because I felt that the man inside in the maelstrom of what was going on was a better judge of what was happening than the people on the sideline. And there were times that I regretted that I had no uh, authority because I could have changed the team. I believe now we might have won one or two all, more All-Irelands. But uh, apart from the fact that you were there to toss the coin, your name was captain on the team, and if you won, you received the cup. That, that was that, it? That was it, yes. Now, who spoke up for the Cork team? Well, uh, the, the famous Jim Tough Barry was our trainer that time, and he had been training Cork teams since the mid-20s. And I think he claims he had trained more All-Ireland hurling champions than anybody else. And, no, I think his claim was more All-Ireland champions because not only did he train Cork, but also Limerick when they were in the All-Ireland finals, and he trained some of the Cork and Mogi teams. So Jim chalked up about maybe 12 or 15 All-Ireland titles. And, and I think he was also a trainer of a Cork football team. Was he good? He was the most dedicated man. He was a, a merchant tailor. Uh, his wife was... a ill and they had no family so his whole life was devoted to hurling and training the team in the old days when the cock hurlers were many of them employed in fords mm -hmm. and some of them in, in these days again i should say that ford was around the clock shift uh, operation and anybody who was happened to be on a shift that didn't suit training of the match tough went on he saw the boss nobody else but the boss and got his men off uh, then he looked after the Harleys, bought the Harleys, weighted them and saw that they were proper cut and design and weight. Looked after the jerseys, made sure they were washed and went down to the athletic grounds to make sure the grass was cut at the right height. And uh, he did everything. He you, did you don't meet his kind very often. You don't you indeed. Don't. You don't indeed. But uh, Tough Perry had, had a great belief in himself because he, he regarded himself as a tenor and he often gave a, a rendering. He'd stay with the, uh, sing with the Cala Rosa. He was a, a good swimmer. He claimed, I don't know if it's true, I think it is true, to have won the Billy Mile swim, and he was a diver. So he was an all-round man, but he wasn't, he wasn't great in the, in the playing of hurling himself, but he had a, a great influence over the teams. Con Murphy, another legendary Cork player and great friend of Jack Lynch's, recalled those days in this archive interview, elsewhere in RTE Sound Archive. Well, in those days now, as I said, travel was difficult. You couldn't... Uh, I a car to travel more than 60 miles and you have a special reason for it. And I think the records will prove uh, how the crowds got to those matches in such numbers is really a mystery. But they got there mostly on bicycles in Munster, cycling from Friday until match time on Sunday and cycling back again. Maybe by some possibly chancy means in the back of a lorry and so on and so forth but they got there and of course the trains were running as well uh, but the depend on the trains to get there on time with the type of fuel they were operating on was always a bit of a guesswork but they got there and uh, there were sizable crowds at all those matches no matter where they were there weren't contractions uh, well especially during the war years uh, and most of us uh, had to travel by bike, which would be a great excuse in those days, of course, when, for example, you go to a match and you might bring a girl to a match and you kind of say, well, of course, with the petrol situation, we have to, we have to use a bike. <laughs> but uh, we all been training night after night, cycling. Some some of the distant fellows, like from Moy, Mitchestown, Middleton, um, Con Murphy from the southeast, Jack Barrett from the southeast came by, by car, but these are hired cars mainly. I don't, I, don't know, I don't think any member of our team owned a car. On the occasion of his 75th birthday, Brian Farrell, broadcaster and political scientist, offered this assessment of Jack Lynch. I think he was an ex is an extraordinary phenomenon. I think the most striking thing that I heard said about Jack Lynch was said by another great Irish politician, and that was Sean Lamass. And Lamass at one stage said to me, he said, the people love Jack Lynch but I wonder will they respect him? And that was the question in his mind in regard to whether or not this extraordinarily likable man, he is that, he is that, that Irish expression, a decent man, that is Jack Lynch, top to bottom. But there's much more than that to him. Uh, of course he was reluctant, he's not the first major Irish politician to have been reluctant. But I think those people, and they included colleagues of his own in the 1960s, 
who thought he was going to be a caretaker, and moreover a, a caretaker that they could get rid of pretty damn fast. They'd got the wrong measure of the wrong man. He, he learned, I think, as much about politics in Croke Park and more importantly in Thurlis and in Cork, as he ever did in Doyle Aaron. I think one of the things he learned was that you had to stand for yourself, but you also had to be a team player. He was extraordinarily good, I think, as a team player, both when he was a minister serving originally under de Valera, then under Lamas, but also, I think, as Tishov, he had a, a great capacity to attract people to him, at, to gain their respect as well as their affection. Lynch biographer T.P. O'Mahony on that same occasion talking to Joe Duffy. Well, I have to admit to a very large bias, a great affection for Jack Lynch, and I speak not just as a corpsman but as a Blackpool man, which of course, as you know, is the home of Glen Rovers and was the heart of Lynch's old constituency. So I couldn't, I was approached recently about another politician and I couldn't, uh, I, I said I wouldn't write a book uh, because I said I, I simply do not admire and respect the individual concerned. And I think in Lynch's case, it was that that fired me initially and, uh, and I still, of course, have that, that great affection for him. Um, I think all that Brian has said is, is true. Um, I think um, I'm reminded of something that happened, um, which I think is an indication of, of his innate modesty. Uh, there was a book launched in Cork called The 21st, 21 Greatest Horrors of All Time, and the outstanding omission was Jack Lynch, and he undertook to launch the book and spoke glowingly of the 21 players who had been included, and yet his own omission was the, the single most newsworthy item about that book. You know, <laughs> and, and that's an indication of that. Uh, he is incredibly modest, modest because we yes. were speaking to him during the week, and, and you know, 75, so what, he said. Yes. He never saw, I think initially, I wouldn't have gone ahead, I think, because initially after Dr. O'Donoghue would probably know more about this than I do, but we, we met him in Cork uh, about four weeks after his resignation, and there was a lot of buzz at the time that he was going to do a book, and the man for whom both myself and Mary Kenny once worked, Tim Pat Coogan, was being mentioned as a possible ghostwriter, and big sums of money were being talked about. Some of the big London publishers were reckoned to be interested. And uh, we met him in Cork, and I think it was his first sort of press conference since his resignation, and uh, he simply, you know, he dismissed the idea. He said he wasn't, he didn't see himself as uh, an historical figure, was the phrase he actually used, and he, he couldn't understand why we were angry with the moment when he revealed that he hadn't kept a diary, he didn't keep any state papers, he had no notes, and we couldn't understand this. And he, he, he said, well, why should I keep them? I mean, who, to whom would they be of interest? And next, here is Jack Lynch talking about hurling greats. Christy Ring. Ring, Ring had a, Ring had a, a, a great um, brain like that, a man of great intellect, unfortunately not very much education, but mm -hmm. I never saw a sharper brain in my life off the field, not necessarily on the field. But I'd say if he had a chance of education, he'd have got very far in business life as well as in, uh, in his sporting life. Did but you like hurling with him? I did. I was lucky in that I never had to play against him because he played with Glen Rovers, with Cork, and the occasions I played with Monster, with Monster, so I never played against him. But I came against, I came up against him in training, and he was very hard. He was only about, as they say in the song, although he's middling small, he's the daddy of them all, but he's about five foot nine, I suppose, but every muscle and bone was hard in him, and his hands, I never saw bigger hands in my life. So if I put my two hands together, well, I'd be about mm. five, one third of one hand over the surface of another. That would the size of, of, of Christy Ring's hands and his wrists, of course, are powerful. He had also belief in himself, had he? Absolutely. And I, I think more than anything else, Ring uh, believed, uh, first of all, that, it, that hurling was the only thing that was a butterfly and that there was nobody able to beat him in hurling. Earlier this year, before the All-Ireland hurling final, we covered the legendary Cork hurler Christy Ring. So briefly here to mark Tim Horgan's recent biography of Christy Ring, Jack Lynch, on Ring, when he died. As long as young men will match their hurling skills against each other on Ireland's green fields, as long as young boys swing their commands for the sheer <clears throat> thrill of the feel and the tingle in their fingers of the impact of ash on leather, as long as hurling is played, the story of Christy Ring will be told, and that will be forever. As long as the red jerseys of Cork, the blue of Munster, the green, black and gold of Glen Rovers, colours that Christy wore with such distinction, as long as we see these colours in manly combat, the memories of Christy's genius and prowess will come tumbling back in profusion. We will, we will relish and savour these memories for we'll hardly see their legs again. Ni veg elehed an rish. Ni veg ahadu an rish. 
agus guiam vate er anam lava a mask nive na hen gorev ega jack lynch on christy ring